this so the conference will now be recorded. Cool. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk today about uh, uh, water track. Uh, very much looking forward to your uh, questions and comments and uh, your reaction really to our solution to low adhesion problems in the rail industry. Uh, my name's John Cook and um, uh, we, water track is basically the result of a joint venture between um, myself at, uh, uh, and Simon Barnard. And uh, effectively, what we're hoping to do today is just talk you through uh, the, uh, the, the, the technology that we're actually um, looking at and give you an insight into some of the, the, the findings and test work that we've been doing. So I'm going to just start by talking through the agenda. Um, first of all, we're going to have an introduction section. We're very lucky to get uh, some uh, scene setting help from Rob Cummings from Northern today. Um, we'll also just, uh, Simon and I also just, just do a quick introduction, uh, just to explain a bit about uh, how we got to the situation we're involved in the rail industry. Um, we're then going to talk a bit about the science behind water track, hopefully not too much on that topic, but we'll give you a bit of an insight into um, some of the fundamentals behind the water track solution. Then we've got a section where we're going to be talking about the test work that we've done. And what I'm hoping we can do there is attempt to summarise what is now really over seven years worth of testing trial work that we've done uh, to, to confirm the benefits of our water track solution. Then with where next, we're going to talk uh, in more detail about our future plans and our real uh, ultimate vision for water track. And finally, the, hopefully the best bit where we get a chance to try to answer your questions and, and get your, your feedback really, um, reaction about uh, what we're, what we're um, doing with WaterTrack. So perhaps I could pass over to Rob Cummings now just to give us a few kind of words to help set the scene really for what we're trying to do um, with WaterTrack. Over to you Rob. Yeah, thanks John. Uh, yeah. I'm Rob Cummings, I'm the Seasonal Performance Improvement Manager for Northern. Um, I've been around Autumn and trying to solve the problem for the best part of 20 years now, both with Network Rail and, and lastly with Northern. Um, we have, we've had a range of uh, mitigations. We run the railhead treatment train, uh, which jets the railhead at, at very high pressure with water. We have these line side uh, traction gel applicators. We have people going out mechanically scrubbing the rail and applying sand. Uh, and to a lesser extent, and it's getting more difficult by the year, uh, we try and do a bit of vegetation management. Um, our colleagues in, in the Leeds area have been trying to do some around the Headingley area for the last year, but have just been tied in knots by all the consultation uh, and people lying side that, uh, that object. So basically each year we, we think we do a little bit more railhead treatments. Um, we might stick an extra TGA or two in. and I've been kind of looking for something over the last two years. What can we do differently? Um, you know, the, the railhead treatment trains are great, but they suffered. We have engineering, they clash with engineering possessions. Um, you struggle to get paths for them during the day. We only get one kind of pass per, on a line of route per day, two if we're lucky. Um, and also we don't, we tend to only operate them six days a week. So you've got a 48 hour period where you don't get any treatment. So to fit something on a service train uh, that would treat a line of route several times a day, doesn't have engineering possession issues, um, and, and you know it can operate seven days a week, uh, will give us a major step forward. Uh, and this is what we're hoping to gain with water track. So uh, I'll let John and Simon uh, crack on with the presentation. Thanks very much, Rob. Very much appreciate that. Um, so yes, back onto back onto our introductions then. Uh, so here here is Simon and myself with an early prototype of our water track system. I'm on the right of this picture, so you can see me here. Um, I'm in my full um, high vis uh, for the day. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by uh, by kind of qualification and background. Um, most of my working career I've spent in the food industry, ironically, which is not, no, a long way away from rail, I know, um, working in new product development, R&D and innovation. 
And uh, recently, you could describe me as a rail industry convert uh, with the work that uh, we've been doing on water track. So I'm now just going to pass over to Simon to say a few words about himself. Okay, thanks, John. So I'm the one on the left. Um, to compliment John, uh, sorry, I'm Simon Barnard. Uh, to compliment John, my background is actually uh, electrical electronic engineering. Uh, started my career in uh, automotive, but probably for the last 30 years or so, I've been working in training and consulting uh, in new product development and innovation, uh, collaborating particularly with John for the last 10 years. And as he said, for the last seven years, focus very much on uh, the water track project, which you're going to hear about this, this afternoon. Great. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, so that's the team behind water track. Uh, and uh, what I'm now going to kind of move on to, as, as promised, I'm going to start to just talk a little bit about the science behind the water track uh, system. Right, so if we wind the clock back to 2013, uh, Simon and I were commissioned by uh, RSSB to conduct a study into technologies and solutions that would address the rail industry problem of low adhesion. This is what RSSB described as a horizon scanning study. So it's looking into the future to see what exciting emerging technologies might be there to, to help us in the future. So at the end of this study, we presented a whole range of potential technologies and solutions. But during the study, we also uncovered some research from, um, from as far back as the 1970s that was conducted by British Rail Research, which at that point was a, a world leading organization for understanding rail industry issues. And when we went through the research papers that were done at that time, we realized that they'd already identified uh, a critical role that water plays in adhesion. What they discovered was if you have a dry contaminated rail, so you've maybe got relief matter on it or oil, or you've got, um, you've got maybe oxides on that, that rail surface, you can still get very good adhesion while that rail is dry. If you have a soaking wet rail, such as you get in very heavy rain, uh, then you still get, surprisingly, even with the contaminants present, very good adhesion. But if the rail is very slightly damp, such as you would get with dew, light rain, um, possibly when you've got, uh, you know, maybe mist and so forth, then that can create very, very low adhesion conditions. And that's, they, they identified this kind of critical point where the adhesion effectively dipped to an incredibly low value. Um, so we, we discovered this and for, for, we presented this back to the rail industry and we, Simon and I were both a bit frustrated because there were no takers. Nobody was interested in this technology. Um, everyone wanted to research other sort of slightly more interesting esoteric um, ideas. Um, but we wanted, we, we felt that it was really important to take this further. So. We then were lucky enough to be able to be awarded some funding where we could work with the University of Sheffield to do some rig based studies. And what we discovered in the lab, you can see here on the, the right hand side, with a small traction rig, is that if we had leaf contaminated um, rollers in this rig, we had a very low traction value. The traction value is equivalent to the friction that we're seeing. Um, but when we added water, so like adding bulk water to that situation, we could create an almost immediate step change improvement in the traction value that we were seeing, which lasted in certain situations for quite a long period of time afterwards. So we found that even, a, and this turned out to be quite a small amount of water that can actually transform the traction coefficient when we created these low adhesion conditions. So this got us quite excited and we thought, well, okay, this works well on the rig, but what would it be like in full scale, um, in full scale conditions? Would it still work if we scaled this up? So then we were able to uh, get some further funding and again, working with the University of Sheffield, we ran some trials using uh, a rather ancient uh, class 117 DMU. Um, and we were able to create some very slippery conditions on the track at Long Marston using leaves and also to a small extent paper tape and in these very slippery conditions, we were able to demonstrate that a small amount of water could transform the braking and traction that we were getting. On the left hand side here, you can see this is the prototype system that we bolted to the front of the DMU. 
it's it's uh, it contains a pump it contains a pressure accumulator and some small elements of control on the right hand side we have a graph of braking distance you can see in meters and we can see three different conditions this is untreated with water so this is just braking on the leaf layer uh, and seeing how far the train slides we're running at about 25 miles per hour in this condition and um, you can see in this area here we were getting some rather long slides up to 125 meters at times but also a lot of variation in our braking distance when you look at what we were able to do when we added water you can see that in equivalent conditions we were already getting significantly reduced braking distances so this was uh, demonstrating again this step change improvement in braking and also traction that we could get in low adhesion conditions but what was interesting was after we'd added the water we got even better results so we ended up with even even less variation and more or less the same level of mean mean braking distances as we had before so we were seeing an accelerated in, increase uh, 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 removal of contaminants which uh, ultimately means we potentially could be seeing benefits for uh, following trains so not only the train that's actually braking but potentially trains following the train that had just applied the water so that was the test work that we did at Long Marston and I'm now going to hand over to Simon to describe some the next stage in the story really some further testing that we did okay thanks John so um, obviously the testing at Long Marston was somewhat speed restricted to 25 miles an hour we wanted to understand a bit about how the system would work at uh, much higher speeds and uh, this was possible by using the the Harold uh, rig up at the University of Huddersfield um, this is a, a full-scale rig so you have a full-size bogey uh, sitting on top of uh, a piece of rail which is wrapped around a wheel so you effectively got a continuous rail running underneath the, the bogey and through the rig you can simulate various uh, loading conditions and high speeds and we carried out testing at 40 and 70 miles an hour, so much higher speeds. On the right hand side, you can see a picture of the uh, water track prototype sat in front of the, of the rig. Um, so we're able to position it there and then uh, deploy the water into the wheel nip um, point you'll see in a moment. So we're gonna have a look at a videotape now of some testing carried out at the um, University of Huddersfield. So, so first of all, you can see our rig situated in front of the, uh, the, the full scale bogey there. Uh, the camera's just coming around now to, to show you the full view of the bogey. And we're zooming in now, a close up view of the wheel sitting above this uh, uh, rail represented on the wheel there. Um, to create the leaf layer, a fairly painful process, but we fed in uh, manually leaves into the nip. Uh, the wheel then crushes those leaves onto the rail in the same way as it would happen uh, on the network. Uh, this leaf layer is then rolled into to the rail and into the wheel and creates what some of you may have seen, this very hard uh, black coat, like a Teflon layer, so it's very, very difficult to remove. To create uh, slippy conditions, what we do is we mist with a small amount of water. You probably saw it there on, on the wheel rail contact point. We're looking now from the side and this is a braking maneuver and the wheel is actually sliding and the brake is coming off and on. You can see the lever and it's moving. That's the brake system with the WSP actuating the brake on and off. And you can see this is a very long slide that's occurring here with the WSP system struggling to recover uh, the friction between the wheel and the rail. Um, so eventually the fr friction recovers and the brake stays on and the wheel will come to rest. So now we're washing it from inside. This time we're going to pre-wet the wheel to make it slippy, but we're actually going to apply the water. You can just see the jet of water there at the bottom of the screen. And at the top of the screen, you may just see the brake lever coming in and out, uh, braking the wheel. And you can see now the friction's recovered and the brake is actually staying on. So with the water addition, we see a much faster recovery of the braking. So that's a video of the actual uh, maneuver occurring. We can have a look now at the actual data we're picking up from the wheel. So this is the graph showing the creep, the creep being the difference in speed between the, uh, the rail and the wheel. And you can see that uh, as the braking maneuver starts, the wheel uh, 
clicks away and we have a creep of um, 20 percent which is the set point for the wheel slide prevention system so um, you can see the braking coming in and out with this speed going up and down as John's showing you there uh, so this creep continues for uh, close to 30 seconds so a very long slide to represent the train sliding a long distance um, down the track and this is a picture of a braking maneuver on leaf layer without the addition of our water you can then contrast that with uh, a water addition trace uh, so you can see now again the, the wheel breaks away uh, when we see the WSP signal we trigger the water addition so water is applied where the red arrow is and you can see the, the, the creep continues for a while but then recovers much more quickly so within about uh, 12 seconds or so the speed drops back down and the wheel is no longer sliding relative to the rail so the addition of water has given us a much faster recovery from uh, the slide 30 seconds reduced down to 12 seconds in this particular example and we did various tests with leaf flare and also simulated uh, using paper tape which gives very extreme um, slide conditions and we saw very dramatic reductions in the time for recovery using the water system. So this was confirming what we'd seen at Long Marston, uh, 25 miles an hour at both 40 and also 70 miles an hour, so very encouraging. But we also uh, discovered uh, a little bit more about this, this cleaning effect that John was mentioning. So here's a, a, a picture of a further braking maneuver. This is again on leaf layer, um, without water addition, you can see the creep curve going up to 20%, and not as long as the previous one you saw, but still some in the order of 14 or 15 seconds of slide occurring. And then the wheel recovered. Um, we went back into the rig to, ready to, to apply a, a new leaf layer, and noticed that you can see in the picture there that there's still some of this black um, leaf mat rolled into the wheel and rail. Um, surfaces so it, it, even after this braking maneuver there's still some retention of the contamination so we we tried uh, braking again on this surface so we, we kept the same uh, didn't add any new leaves kept the same conditions and ran the braking again and as we misted with the water we had three further uh, excursions so three further slides occurring on the same surface so you could imagine this would be following trains coming down the same piece of track, experiencing again the same slide that the first train did. So the, the slippy conditions re, were, uh, remain uh, over several braking maneuvers. Uh, we then created a new leaf and this time applied the water. And as before, you can see the water gives us a fast recovery. Um, we, we see the creep, the water is applied, the creep drops down to zero and the wheel recovers. But we then went on again and continued to, to uh, try and create slippy conditions by misting. Um, and you can see that despite that, there was no further wheel slide activity. So effectively, the first application of water had given us the um, a, a cleaning effect as well as a benefit for the leading train. So this was an important learning for us about the fact that we're not just benefiting the train with the water addition, we're also providing benefit for further trains and that's starting to lead towards what Rob was talking about in the introduction, the possibility that maybe service trains could actually start to take over the role of the railhead treatment train. So that was some testing we carried out on the, the, the Harold High Speed Rig. I'm now gonna hand back to John and tell you about the next stage of our train testing. Thanks Simon. So uh, yeah. The next stage really of our testing was to to look at so so far we've tested on a rig the Harold rig we've tested before that with our uh, heritage uh, class 117 DMU now we wanted to try to understand whether water track could still deliver the benefits we'd seen with the previous test but on a modern train so a train equipped with wheel slide protection systems a train equipped with disc brakes a train also equipped with the sanding systems that we have on, on pretty much all modern uh, service trains. So we were uh, lucky enough to be able to fit our train to uh, something called the Hydroflex train, which some of you may know is uh, a hydrogen fuel cell driven train. Um, so very much experimental train, but it's based on a class 319 um, 
train, which is a fairly standard, um, well, has been a fairly standard train uh, on much of the network in the past. Um, so the water track system that we, we tested on the class, the, on the Hydroflex train consisted of a water delivery unit, which is a, around about a 200 litre tank with a pump and accumulator which is then controlled from a control unit which takes its signal from the wheel slide protection system. When the wheel slide protection system is triggered, detecting uh, wheel slide, the control unit then triggers the water delivery unit which delivers water to nozzles ahead of the leading axle of the train. Um, unlike the high pressure water jetting systems that uh, we've been talking about so far, our system operates at a much lower pressure. We're operating at around about seven bar and delivering a flow rate of water rather than a thousand litres per minute, which is what a high pressure water jetting train will do, we're talking about three litres per minute, um, which equates to between about one and four millilitres per metre of rail as we're travelling along the rail um, at different speeds. Uh, on the right hand side you can see a kind of schematic of our system, so this is, um, this is a kind of a CAD view of the water track tank under the train, on the lower view, you can actually see the Hydroflex train in action. What I'm now going to show is some video of the, uh, of the actual train um, going through the braking manoeuvre. So uh, what we have here is the view of the, uh, the wheel as it slides in the upper view here without water track and it rolls in the lower view here with water track being delivered. Um, on the actual train itself. So you can see, hopefully it's not too steppy, you can see that we've been rolling pretty much all of the time here with the water track system, where we've been seeing quite a lot of slide on the system um, on the view above. You can also see that we've pretty much come to a standstill now with the water track system, but we're also roll still rolling along without water track being operating. Um, when we look at this side by side, so here we have again the train on the side view of the train uh, coming to a stand. Um, at the top view is with again without the water track system, you can see that we're actually braking over a longer distance. On the lower view, you can see this is with water track and we end up stopping the train here <clears throat> in around about 76 meters, as opposed to 97 meters in this case without water track. And uh, you can see that we've effectively got a dif distance difference there of around about 20, or so meters, which equates to, you could think of this maybe as a station overrun of 20 meters, so the length of entire carriage potentially that we might have if we didn't have a water track operation in those conditions. So just kind of summarizing the um, kind of testing that we did here, what we have on the left hand side here is a uh, basically a, a, a graph showing deceleration in percent G. Um, going from lower deceleration to higher deceleration. And here we have stopping with just the sand being applied. So during these trials, we had the sanding being applied at all times. But in this case, we in the other side, you can see this is decelerations we achieved when we delivered water and sand. So we're looking at keeping the sanding system on the Hydroflex train operational, but also adding water to it to, to see whether that gives an enhancement. And you can see on the left hand side here that with these results here we're, we're, we're below 3% G on our deceleration which is which was fa fairly scary braking in fact even though we were only braking from around about 18 to 20 miles per hour the driver was really struggling quite often to bring the train to stop um, and sometimes he was struggling so much that he had to interrupt the braking maneuver and let the train roll on a bit further till it passed the section of track that we'd created which was low adhesion uh, track so he could get a better better deceleration. Um, whereas on this side you can see with water and sand we're significantly improving the deceleration. Incidentally better is lower down in this particular graph so if you go further down in the graph that's better deceleration. Um, and you can see that we're getting much better braking when we're adding water in conjunction with the sand. So we're seeing a big improvement in braking performance and in fact we're looking at somewhere in the region of 1.8% G increase in braking performance just by adding water in these contaminated rail conditions. On the right hand side you can see a time series, so a number of different runs on the same section of contaminated track 
with just sand on its own. Uh, this is the, the kind of brownie trace and with water, water track and sand on this lower trace. And what you can see here is not only do you get this improvement for the first braking maneuver, but you also have a sustained um, improvement uh, as you go through the, 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 the various different following runs. And you see this accelerated cleaning improve effect that we've been describing earlier, um, because you can think of these runs potentially as following trains. So that again was very exciting for us to see this as a, as a conclusion from that testing. So having got really promising results from those trials, the next step was to move from the test track to the main line, um, admittedly under signal protection, but onto the main line nevertheless. So last autumn, we had the opportunity to uh, fit our prototype system, our water track system, at either end of a Northern Class 319 service train. So we fitted this in October last year, and, and after fitting, uh, the train actually ran for 16,000 miles before the system was removed in January, with no reported issues for the train or the infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned before, the train was only uh, the system, our water track systems were only operational during trials on the signal protected zone. Um, but that was really promising because it, it demonstrates the robustness of the actual system that we had fitted to the train. Um, the other thing that we were able to check out was how the uh, water track system would fit with procedures in the depot. And we, the feedback from this was that it fitted extremely well. It, it worked very well within the existing procedures in the depot. The equipment that we needed to fill the tank was uh, already available, readily available and, and routinely used and uh, the procedures that we, we followed very much, they fitted very much with the standard operational procedures. So that seemed to be a very uh, well integrated um, solution as well from that point of view. So what I'm going to show you now is just a little, just to illustrate this system on the train, I'm going to just show you some slow speed um, train running um, in the depot, just to give you an indication of how the system looked on the train. So here you can see the train, you may just be able to see at the bottom here some uh, water being sprayed. Now you've got a slightly easier view. You can see the water coming through there as we go um, over the camera. You've now got a side view. There's the water being dispensed. And then you can see um, multiple axle passes as we pass the same section that we've just sprayed um, with the water. So you can see uh, we've not got the full length of the train going through here, but the train's going to go multiple axles until it kind of comes to a stand. Um, I think it's going to stop fairly soon. There we are. Uh, what you've got to draw your attention to is the track was still quite nicely wetted even after the, all those axle passes. Then you can see the system installed on the train here. Here's the pipe run from the uh, water system down to the nozzles. The nozzles are mounted on the lifesavers ahead of the leading axle of the train. Here's a shot of the, um, the accumulator showing how dirty everything gets under the train. Here's some of the hosing and here's one of the dis delivery nozzles that we were describing earlier. And finally, just a shot of the 200 litre water tank and the filler that you can see there on the system. So that gives you a bit of an indication of, the, of how the system was installed onto the train um, and, and how it was operating, um, at least in the depot. So I'm now going to hand back to Simon just to describe a bit more about the, the testing that we did and the results that we got from that testing uh, last autumn. Okay, thanks, John. So as uh, John said, with uh, tremendous support from uh, both Northern and from Network Rail, we were able to run uh, four nights of testing uh, last autumn. Um, the testing was carried out on a section of track between Prescott and Innsmoss. Um, Network Rail set up for us uh, a signal protection zone on the upline um, between Prescott and Innsmoss, and we were able to cross over between uh, Innsmoss and again at St. Helens onto the downline. And this allowed us to, to loop the train around the same bit of track uh, to investigate the effect of the water system on following trains. Um, over the course of the four nights, the uh, adhesion warning uh, system was uh, showing red for three nights and one yellow. So we were comfortable that we'd be seeing autumn conditions during the, the testing. 
in order for us to be able to test on um, contaminated rail, the railhead treatment train that would normally come through um, on the evening before our testing was suspended on the um, upline, uh, but it continued to clean the, the downline. So the upline was, was hopefully still contaminated. Uh, during the uh, four nights, um, we, we saw a combination of both WSP triggered water dispensing and also did quite a lot of manual dispensing, testing out various conditions. So this was a major milestone for us, the, the first time that ever water track was deployed on the main line. Just before we go, the, the picture, by the way, on the right hand side, if you just go back a second, John, is a, is a shot, I think, around about three o'clock in the morning um, of the uh, of train. I think this might be been in St. Helens, I can't remember, but the gentleman on the platform there was Rob Cummins, um, giving us tremendous support at three in the morning. So thanks very much to Rob for that. OK, next slide, John. Um, so if we have a look at, uh, we'll, we'll zoom in now to some of the test results and we'll zoom in to a section of the journey that the driver was asked to basically simulate a normal uh, traffic uh, station to station operation. So uh, we're looking here at the journey from Garswood to Bryn. On the horizontal axis, you've got the time uh, in seconds and on the uh, vertical axis, you've got the train speed taken directly from the, the, train, the train speedometer, what the, the driver was in the cab. And three traces are three, uh, three laps that we carried out, um, roughly about 20 minutes a lap, so 20 minute time gap between each uh, lap. So if we start off by having a look at the um, journey out of Garswood, the um, train moving away from Garswood, uh, you can see on the blue trace on lap one, the train um, struggled to get good traction out of the station, so the the acceleration is particularly poor on one. Um, so on lap two, we actually uh, manually deployed water as the driver was departing. So you can see the orange trace there has a much better acceleration curve and the uh, acceleration rate there you can see is much greater uh, on lap two. And then on lap three, uh, we didn't deploy any further water, but the, the traction was good again, and you can see the acceleration was even better on lap three than it was on, on lap two. So you can see a nice progression of improvement there from lap one to lap two with water and then lap three. If we now look at the right-hand side, look at the uh, arrival breaking into Bryn. Uh, blue trace, uh, you can see uh, quite big dips in the trace towards zero. Uh, this is basically showing you that the wheels of the train are locking up, so the speed goes to zero. Uh, that lockup then triggers the wheel slide prevention system, and also, of course, in this case, triggers water. Uh, so water was deployed during the braking on lap one, and despite this uh, obviously very slippy conditions, the train still achieved about an eight percent or a minus eight percent g, so a very respectable deceleration. I should uh, add, we're asking the driver here to use full service brakes. So this is, we're deliberately trying to push the uh, braking to find the adhesion points. So this is full service brakes that are being applied. Um, on lap two, um, we didn't uh, deploy any further water, but you can see that the braking decel is much greater. There's a very slight breakaway of the speed trace, uh, but basically it wasn't sufficient to trigger the WSP. So it was a very good braking maneuver at minus 9%. And then lap three, better still, achieved a minus 11%. So again, you see this nice progression of improvement from the uh, addition of water. Uh, and in fact, over the course of all our testing, I think the, uh, the figures we saw, or the lowest figure we saw with, with water was about 7.4% 7, 7 deceleration. I should mention that during the testing, we did see some decelerations as bad as 3%. Um, where we weren't allowed to deploy water, that was on the down line, which was interesting, of course, the line that had been cleaned. So it's a slightly uh, interesting to note that the cleaned line actually gave worse deceleration figures than the non-cleaned line, but that's a, maybe another discussion to be had. So if you put the improvement in um, acceleration and the improvement in deceleration together and think about it in terms of a journey, uh, getting a progressive improvement in the journey time between uh, Garswood and through the addition of water, both on the 
acceleration and the deceleration. So as part of the uh, trial, Northern were able to provide us with quite a large data set of journey times, uh, not just for our testing train, but for all trains traveling between Garswood and Bryn. Looking here at um, a summary of the journey times between Garswood and Bryn for the Class 319 train last year. So the top graph is looking at the uh, results from the summer and the lower graph is looking at the results from autumn. And the uh, frontal axis again is journey time. So the further to the right we are, the longer the journey time is. And the vertical axis is looking at the number of trains. So it's a histogram or distribution showing you the journey times. Uh, what should be pretty obvious is that the distribution at, at the bottom, the autumn distribution, is shifted to the right by about eight seconds. So on average, the journey time between Garswood and Bryn is about eight seconds longer in autumn than it is in summer. Um, the other thing you can perhaps see from the picture is that the variation in journey time is much larger in autumn. It's not just about the average. There's more variation. and uh, I think it's something like about 6% of trains in autumn would be more than 30 seconds delayed. So it's both a, an increase in journey time and a variation, which uh, turns into the autumn problem that passengers experience with train delays. And of course, this is only eight seconds, but remember, this is just one station. Uh, accumulate this across any long journey, and you can very quickly see how this uh, causes uh, problems in the network. This is class 319. Um, the class 331 train also operates this same uh, section, more modern train, and the data that was very, very similar in terms of the shift from uh, summer to average. So we were able to overlay some of our test data, in fact, the data we were just looking at in the previous graph on, on these distributions. And so over the course of um, our four nights of testing, we saw uh, a range from good to bad um, conditions. So uh, the good adhesion, we had a night where we had very heavy rain, and uh, we think of heavy rain as being the nature's water track, if you like. We know that uh, rain has the adhesion condition. Um, the red line, the poor adhesion, that was the example I uh, mentioned where we saw very poor traction, uh, sorry, very poor adhesion, um, and um, it gave this very wide variation and delays, uh, and that was on the down line. And then you can see the uh, results of where we applied the water, giving us a step towards the good adhesion and also much more consistency. And we know from, from this, this trial and from all the previous work that we would see a progressive improvement uh, with the water addition towards the, the good adhesion condition. So this is, this is showing us, uh, again, uh, some of the potential operational benefits that the water system can provide by improving the adhesion of the, of the train and also following trains. Okay, next slide, please, John. Um, one of the things we wanted to make sure was, especially as the railhead treatment train had been suspended for the night of our testing, uh, and also just to understand uh, or make sure we're making no avert impact through water deployment. We looked at all the journey times um, for the trains uh, through October and November. Um, so what you're seeing here is on the left, October, on the right, November, the vertical axis is journey times, and all the dots uh, represent uh, train journeys occurring on each day to the 11 a.m. mark, which is where the railhead treatment train passes through. Um, red lines, uh, the 28th of October, 11th, 18th, and 25th of November, are the mornings after our testing. And you can see, if you look across there, that there's no uh, adverse impact um, of the water track testing. You don't see a, a sudden jump or increase in the journey times. So this reassured us that uh, we weren't causing any adverse impact through the water system and I guess the other interesting observation is it, it doesn't seem to have been um, negative that the railhead treatment train didn't pass through um, so I, either we've uh, compensated for the railhead treatment train or the railhead treatment hasn't had a, a, a big impact. 
Um, next slide, please, John. Um, we also, uh, one of the other ways we were interested in looking at the data was by looking at the journey time by time of day. And uh, you're seeing this is class 331 data, still between Garswood and Bin. Um, and on the left hand side, you're looking at the summer uh, results. And on the right hand graph, we're looking at autumn results. And on the left hand graph, first of all, you can see that from early morning through to late afternoon, early evening, there's really no change in the journey time. Uh, it's, it's staying really consistent all the way through the day, with perhaps just one exception the late train, the last train of the night, does seem to have a longer journey time, but little difference as you go through the day. When you look at the right hand graph, which is the autumn data, you'll see that there is actually a, a trend occurring showing in the morning, the morning we have the uh, quite long journey times reducing through the day and then increasing again as we go towards the evening time. And this perhaps reflects um, the moisture level, the dew level or the moisture that's, that's on the railhead, which is high in the morning and high again in the evening. So this is uh, showing perhaps the effect moisture which we know is critical in affecting the um, adhesion on on the track. Uh, interestingly if you just advance the slide John, uh, if you overlay this, the railhead treatment passes which on this section of rail occur around about 11 o'clock in the morning and overnight, um, you don't see a very dramatic impact of the railhead treatment trains. There's perhaps a very slight improvement from the 11 o'clock train. There's no obvious improvement of the overnight train. So it does just put a little bit of a question mark over the impact of railhead treatment trains in terms of their impact on adhesion. We know, of course, that railhead treatment trains are also dealing with tracks at issue as well. But uh, on the adhesion side, from this particular set of data, there's no obvious benefit being shown of the railhead treatment trains. Okay, so that's some of the data. Uh, one of the very important things and pleasing for us was the driver feedback. Um, I think it's well known and understood now. One of the big impacts um, of autumn or causes of the autumn uh, change is the, the way that drivers uh, drive the trains in autumn. Um, and it's very important, therefore, that the driver has confidence in the, uh, in the system and in the adhesion that he's going to get from the braking system. Or he or she is going to get. Uh, so this was some of the, the positive comments that we got from drivers both in on the Hydroflex train and also from the um, northern testing we did this last autumn. And generally I think it's perhaps because the, the, the driver is sitting directly over the front bogey, over the front axle where the water is being deployed, they're picking up or perceiving some very positive impact of the, uh, the water additions. So I think this is going to contribute uh, positively to the driver confidence in braking with the water. Um, we also, as part of the testing, deliberately set the water off when we, when we shouldn't. So in the middle of a braking maneuver, there's no slide occurring. We, we just deployed water just what would happen. And there was no uh, adverse impact. The driver didn't notice or comment on anything negative in that way. So we tested both the correct operation and a possible error where the water would deploy by mistake. Uh, so there's a couple of quotes there. We've got like a, a short video of, of the rug driver who drove the Hydroflex train to hear his first his comments about the To be honest, when they told me two or three weeks ago that they were going to put water on as a um, alternative to sanding for uh, wheel slide, um, I was quite you know confused that, that whether water could be used as a uh, as a good alternative, and, uh, and to be perfectly honest, this last uh, couple of days, it's uh, it's turned my views quite substantially. Uh, it, to, to me, it's a really fantastic medium. Um, I've seen from first hand from driving. You know, I've been driving trains for 42 years now, and the adhesion using water was was quite incredible. It's yeah, it's it, it is really good, uh, and and. From my point of view, sand damages track, it damages points, it's an abrasive, whereas water is a medium 
readily available and yeah it's definitely proved to me that it does slow trains down and stops trains in a good distance. Okay so that's uh, to hear from the driver's side that they also see some benefits. Okay so that's a good uh, description of our testing this autumn. I'm going to hand back to John now to give you a bit of a summary of what we've uh, completed so far. Great, thanks Simon. Uh, so let's just recap a bit on what we've been talking about with our last seven, maybe nearly eight years worth of um, work. Uh, first of all, we've uh, we, we talked about the, uh, the low adhesion horizon scanning work that we did for uh, RSSB around about 2013. This really gave a possible o overview of possible solutions that might be appropriate to deal with low adhesion. But this was really where we started to make our discoveries around the critical role of water, or you could say rediscoveries, um, re unearthing research that went back to the 1970s. Then we had our first phase of work that we did uh, in the lab, and this was a demonstration of the effect of water, and it really confirmed the findings from the previous research and gave us confidence to move further forwards. Um, we then did the second phase of that work, um, and this was where we had our first full-scale demonstration of water-assisted uh, braking using the Class 117 train at Long Marston. Then we did another project, uh, first of a kind, FOAC stands for first of a kind round three project, which was funded by Innovate U or by the Department for Transport and managed by Innovate UK. We had a lot of help from Porterbrook with that one and the University of Birmingham. Um, and uh, with this one, this was our first modern train, which we managed to uh, improve the braking with the, uh, the addition of water and demonstrate how water could work with the sanding as well. And then we did a further first of a kind project. And this is the first mainline demonstration of um, water track in operation um, on a signal protected section of, of mainline. Uh, demonstrating potentially the operational benefits that we could get from um, water as a means of improving braking. So that brings us really to the end of the, the, the discussion about the stuff, the work that we've done previously. But let's just have a discussion now about um, where we see water track going in future. So where next for water track? So we've done quite a lot of work now on beginning to plan out really what the business plan for water track could look like in the next five years. So what we have here really is a number of uh, stages towards, um, towards a kind of a fully grown business. Uh, the first stage here in 2021, uh, so this year, um, we're talking about a pilot trial. We're looking at um, running water track in a class 319 and potentially a class 170 train and looking to convert two 319 trains and two class 170 trains to operate with uh, with water track and the purpose of this really is to um, to build up in-service evidence for um, water deployment so this is deploying from passenger service trains to demonstrate the operational benefits that we might be able to get from uh, using water then in 2022 we're looking at an extended trial here where we uh, add a further 10 units, we train, we convert another 10 units, and from this we hopefully will be able to demonstrate local operational benefits and really start to produce an impact on the delays for trains operating in that area, um, which we see can potentially start to give us some significant um, payback. Then in 2023, we're looking at a further 30 units and once again, we're talking about um, uh, benefits for the reg regional area. So further, further units being fitted with this would mean that we can spread the benefits over a larger area. But we're also starting to look at potentially reducing the requirement for railhead treatment trains. Now, um, the figures for how much a railhead treatment train costs to operate obviously are uh, not that easy to obtain. But uh, we've, we estimated before it was somewhere between about 20 and 35,000 pounds per week during autumn to operate one rowhead treatment train. It could be significantly higher than it. it may even be as much as 55 
uh, £1,000 per year. So there's potentially a big prize there if we could start to reduce the requirement for railhead treatment trains. In 2024, we're looking to add another 70 water track equipped units to the network. And again, this means that we can start to spread the benefits further across the network. Then in 2025, we're looking at a full ramp up, um, another 90 units into, uh, into operation with water track equipped at that point. And um, so at that point, we're starting to be able to, to make a network wide impact by what we've added. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, subject to contract negotiations, uh, the first part of this plan has now been, um, has now received or will receive uh, Performance Innovation Fund um, uh, support from Network Rail um, via Northern. So we're hoping to work with Northern to do this first um, pilot trial this autumn. A little bit more about where we're aiming to go first with WaterTrack. Um, our initial focus is going to be on shorter units. So we're looking at two car and some three car units. There are two main reasons for why we're focusing on the, those specific vehicles first. The, the first one is that um, certainly two car units and three car units account for more than 50% of the PPM. So that's a measure of delay um, within, within the network at the moment. So these are a particularly a hotspot um, potentially for adhesion related delays. Um, the second reason is there's another initiative going on at the moment related to low adhesion, which is called double variable rate sanding. Maybe you, you may have heard of this before, but um, this is an initiative that's looking to convert trains um, to have further sanding systems on it. You fit more sanders, you deliver more sand to the, uh, to, to the, the, the rail, um, and you therefore get uh, an increased braking effect in low adhesion conditions. This typically works a lot better on longer trains. First of all, trains where potentially you've got more room to fit uh, the double variable rate kit. And secondly, on trains where, uh, where you've got uh, sufficient um, axles to be able to, to benefit from this, um, you can't really fit a double variable rate sanding system onto a two car unit, for example. Um, so uh, we, we think that we have a potential niche opportunity to apply um, water track on um, shorter units. As I said, two car and some three car units are our kind of initial focus. Um, in terms of the payback for the, for the industry, um, we're focusing here with our payback projection on just the benefit around reducing delay minutes. So, what we've done here is we're um, looking at the payback related to some figures that we've derived from the double variable rate um, sanding business um, proposal and business plan. And we've scaled those down by um, a certain amount, which you can see in the small print at the bottom. Um, we've also assumed that the cost for our installed system, so this is two water track units installed at either end of the, of the train, so per unit, the, pr the price for that is £30,000. And having done uh, quite a lot of cost um, analysis work on the water track system, we think this is a, a very achievable figure because fundamentally the water track system is a very simple um, system comprising uh, a tank and a pump and some nozzles. I oh, want some pipe work as well. And um, dependent on which uh, case we look at, whether it's the upper case or the lower case on our estimates here, um, we see a break even here somewhere between 2024 and 2025. So we see the payback actually kicking in quite early in terms of what this uh, the water track system can, can give. So and as I said before, this is just assuming reduced delay minutes. This doesn't assume anything to do with reduced railhead treatment train usage um, or any of the benefits related to other operational aspects that we might gain through um, improved train braking just purely delays. So just kind of coming back to where do we ultimately want to get to with water track. So I might have mentioned before we see water track really is a distributed tr service train mounted railhead treatment solution. So we see water track improving the braking and traction robustness for the trains that are actually equipped with water track. But also we see that the railhead cleaning uh, benefits that we've 
described earlier and Simon was talking about earlier, um, we see those benefits potentially for following trains and providing that railhead cleaning solution. So long term, as we enhance the water track system performance through further work that we are currently, currently um, planning out, uh, we see the long term goal as completely replacing the need for railhead treatment trains. Um, so completely getting rid of the need for railhead treatment trains and all the disruption that that can, that can provide, and also um, removing the need uh, ultimately for on-train sanding systems and all the complexity and, and, and other problems that arise from the use of sand. So that's really kind of concluded where we've got to with, with this presentation. I'd really like to open it up now for some kind of further questions and comments from, from the audience. Does anybody have any questions? There was one earlier on from, um, from, but it was in regards to a question you've already asked. I think it was the effectiveness in comparison with sand, and I think you quite quickly after that led on to to demonstrate sand and sand plus water track. So I think that question's answered. Uh, right, um, Dave, Dave Woods asked, are there any additional benefits for line side neighbours, such as reducing wheel squeal? Interesting. Um, yeah. Do you want to have a go at that one, Simon? Or? <laughs> well, it's an interesting idea. We, we, we recognise that uh, having the resource of water on the train opens up some opportunities. Obviously, our primary focus at the moment is on low adhesion and deploying with WSP triggering. But it's certainly been uh, talked about possibility of deploying water in other circumstances. For example, we could deploy water uh, based location. So in, in known areas where uh, perhaps historically there's been problems with buildup of leaf layer. Um, and I guess that could extend to if there is an area of the, I guess this is on, uh, is it on corners and things, wheel squeal particularly, I don't know, show my ignorance here, but if there was a known area, maybe water could actually give some um, sound reduction or noise reduction. Um, mm. That would certainly be a possible. It's one we maybe should uh, look into a little bit more. Yeah, so I mean there you. are there, there there is some evidence that um, water has been used in the past in places like shunting yards to reduce um, noise from from trains on particular sections of track. So it is it, it has been has been used in that way in the past. I know we used it on network rail at Birmingham, but I think all they managed to do was flood the flood the track and create wet beds. But they were probably um, buying quite a lot more in that situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that doesn't sound desirable. Uh, Felix has <laughs> suggested that water for noise reduction is popular on tramways, for example, in Zurich. Interesting. Um, another okay. question, a uh, couple more questions. I'll take the first one from Lee, as it might be a simpler one. Uh, yes, if this system uses its own water tank, and if so, is there any risk of the water freezing, and is any heating required? Okay, shall I have a go? Um, so yeah. uh, the the system that we're using has a, an on-train water tank. The water tank currently is about 200 litres. We're potentially going to be downsizing that tank a little bit based on some of the most recent work that we've been doing. Um, the, ta the tank itself has trace heating. So whenever the train is operating, the tank um, is also uh, heated and powered. Um, so that raises the water temperature above freezing. Um, we have done some trials. Uh, where we have taken the water system down to uh, minus 14 degrees C um, and the components that we have in the system uh, in that particular system survived um, being taken down to that lower temperature without, that was without the trace heating operating. Um, and, and the system after, after thawing uh, functioned um, perfectly. Um, the, the actual issue, I guess, that we're concerned about there with the, with the tank freezing is the risk of it, um, of it, of the tank fracturing due to that, due to the freezing. It's exactly the same issue as we have with other tanks that are already on the train, though. So if you have a train that's going to have a, si a situation where the water tank freezes up, you've probably also got a, 
a, a, a toilet tank that needs to needs to be um, unfrozen as well, which may well be under the drain, the waste the waste from the toilet, for example, and that again will need to be dealt with. And maybe the harder one okay. to um, to potentially finish on is from Kevin Meller. Ke Kevin's actually just trying to get his head around how it's working. He says he's not disputed it, but he's just wondering how it actually works. And he's um, how he's asking if the water acts as a hydraulic cleaner and whether the wheel rail interface forces uh, play a part in it all. Well, now... But basically, what's the science behind it? Now, the question... Th this is interesting. Now, I did call it the science behind it. Um, because there, is, there is some, there are some discussions and hy I would say hypotheses about what's happening. Um, but it's interesting we've been, we've engaged with some of the kind of top tribologists in, in well probably in the world in terms of wheel rail interface. So Roger Lewis at uh, at the University of Sheffield, and we still end up kind of having some interesting conversations about exactly what's going on. Um, the, the, the things that one possible hypothesis is that when we when we have a very small amount of water combined with contaminants on the on the railhead that the actual water and contaminants while still behaving like a liquid actually don't behave like a liquid that would normally flow so they they um, develop non-newtonian flow characteristics if you like and there is some evidence from studies that the university of sheffield have done that when you have a very small proportion of water in relation to the solids, you end up with very strange flow characteristics. So you, effectively, that the the, 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 the the this mixture shear thickens when it's when very high forces are applied to it, and it doesn't get out of the way, but it does become slippy. Um, that's probably the best theory we've got in terms of one aspect of how it works. But in terms of removal of contaminants, um, we think it's most likely related to the softening effect of water. Water will soften contaminants on the railhead um, and it will also help those contaminants to flow away from the contact point if we've got a reasonable amount of water there. So we, we move back to normal Newtonian flow mechanics rather than um, unconventional and strange mechanics that, as I say, puzzle tribologists. I don't know, do you want to say anything, Simon? <laughs> Uh, no, I'll go with that answer, John. That was good. <laughs> but yes, it's a good question to ask. And a lot of head scratching usually results. Has anyone got any other questions? No, if, um, if there's no more questions, can I hand over to Dave to say thanks, please? Thank you, thank you, Lynn. And well, first of all, Lynn uh, and committee, thank thank you for uh, letting the Manchester and Liverpool section join today. Uh, I think these meetings and the quality of the meeting today just shows how informative some of the PWI section uh, briefs are now, and, and and the wealth of information that's available. And I think this will this will add to that uh, noise that's on the YouTube site. Um, so thanks to, to John and Simon. And briefly, I think Rob Rob made a an appearance today so thanks to Rob uh, a really informative and well presented presentation um, touching on some of the innovation looking at kind of the source data and, and building on that the work through I, I really didn't believe I was going to be hearing non-Newtonian flow uh, being mentioned today which, which I have done but the, the innovation I think is you know, just uh, Getting that out to, to, to colleagues within the rail industry, at least knowing that this uh, opportunity is out there. Uh, I'm working on a current scheme at the moment where we're trying to f find seconds from a line speed improvement. Uh, but what you're proposing there seems to be at least a way of, of maintaining uh, you know, line speed, journey time proposals as opposed to deteriorating throughout the autumn. Uh, and, and it feels like it's a it's a logical way to, to pursue that initi initiative. Also, I, I kind of made a note of little did I know there was a, a little test track at the outskirts of Wigan, uh, which I am located at the moment. So that was news to me, but that's uh, I'll speak to Rob about that. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I noted that thing about wheel, wheel squeal. I think I have not been aware that, that that's been a key issue in some areas and from an you know, environmental perspective, maybe in 
in, in cities that this could be uh, an additional initiative. So uh, anyway, thanks again for the presentation. If I can ask the uh, attendees from both sections to um, uh, if we can unmute ourselves and give yourself uh, give you a round of applause to to, to uh, Simon and, uh, and John uh, and there we go. Anyone? Very good. Just speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Never had one of those before. No, that's <laughs> you. <laughs> Guys, we, thank try you. To, we keep we try to keep the traditions going, if, even if only virtually. <laughs> but thank you, gents. That was very in. That was very informative. I did um, some work with Alastair, who's on our Northwest Ch uh, Cheshire and North Wales committee a number of years ago into traction gel applicators, and our backgrounds both rail. So um, yeah, we could have a long old talk about um, about sand and um, and water at some point. I'm sure. <laughs> I really yeah, think maybe. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone joining us. And as I said, our young people's talk, your young professionals talk is next month. So it'd be great if we could get some support for them too. So I hope to hear from both of you next month. Thank you, gents. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. The train approaching at 4.40 is the 1727 Transpanel Express Service.